Joining us now is OGOP with stories trending around the world. Hello, Genix. What happened to special? <laughs> Good morning, Dr. No, you know you're special all the time. You always. are special. We're all special. Good morning, Geisha. Good morning. <laughs> you, you look beautiful. <laughs> How are you to do laugh? I'm doing, I'm doing well. Good morning, Rafai. How are you? Morning, Oji. How are you? How's it going? Doing How's well, it? thank you. Good morning, yeah. Great. Well, good morning to you, viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In the United States, former President Donald Trump has filed a lawsuit against tech giants Google, Twitter, and Facebook, claiming that he is the victim of censorship. We're demanding an end to the shadow banning a stop to the silencing and a stop to the blacklisting, banishing and cancelling that you know so well. In France, 11 men and women from around the country were found guilty on Wednesday of using the internet to harass a teenager known as Miller, who became the focus of heated debates about free speech and blasphemy after she posted an anti-Islam rant that went viral. In Norway, in a bid to reduce body pressure among young people, the government is set to implement a law that will censor social media influencers from posting edited pictures without making it known. The rules will affect any paid posts across all social media platforms. In Haiti, global leaders have shared their condolence in the wake of the assassination of President Jovenel Moise, who was killed in his home on Wednesday in the nation's capital, Port-au-Prince, by a group of armed men, the yet-to-be-identified gunmen, stunned the president's home at around 1 a.m. and also injured his wife, Martine Moise, who is now at the hospital in Fort Lauderdale, South Florida. Under sports, Wembley Stadium in London on Wednesday was filled with excitement after the three Lions of England qualified for the European Championship final after defeating Denmark two goals to one, the first of such feat since the 1966 World Cup final. Under entertainment, embattled 83-year-old American actor and comedian Bill Cosby, who was recently released from prison, issued a statement on Wednesday in response to a civil lawsuit filed by high-powered attorney Gloria Allred, alleging that he sexually assaulted a woman, Judy Huff, in her youth at the Playboy Mansion in 1974. The actor says he is ready to fight, declare his name once and for all. Finally, Arise News Digital has received the trophy for online news platform of the year, won by Arise TV at the 2021 Gage Awards. The award is especially notable as it comes barely six months after the launch of the digital arm of the TV channel, which broadcasts out of London, New York, Lagos and Abuja. Well, we have joining us now, head of our digital team, Demola Ojo, and our social media manager, Harim Omorui, to tell us what this award means for Rise News. Hello, Harim and Demola. Good morning, Ojo. Good morning. Good morning. Now, Demola, tell us what this award means for Rise TV. Thank you very much, Oji. Good morning, Dr. Abati. Good morning, Tundu. Demola, it's good to see you. Harim, how are you? So yes, um, it means a lot. I mean, it's, uh, we'll call it just reward for the tireless shift everybody in the team has put in. And that includes you guys there in the studio and everybody in the back room. As you all know, or to tell our viewers, most of our content, apart from the ones that we generate um, individually, we also get from our correspondents across the world. We're talking London, New York, and back here in Nigeria. So it means a lot to us, um, and thank you. Fantastic. Harim, as a social media manager, tell us how you were able to achieve this incredible feat, given that your team was formed barely six months ago and Arise TV was up against other major platforms, including the BBC. Yes, thank you, Oji. So we actually, my team was actually formed in May last year, so a little over a year now, um, with just two of us, my trusty editor, Olavi, and I. And we were churning out content every day. Everything that Arise puts out, we put on our social media platforms, all of them. Um, of course, this won't be possible without the content that we're producing at Arise and our producers and 
writers and everybody that is on the field um, gaining or getting us great content. So I think the stories that we're telling, the news that we're putting out, that is why we're able to achieve such an award. We obviously stand out. Well, congratulations to Arise News and uh, congratulations to your team, uh, Demola and uh, Arim. Well, Arim, I, I will spare you, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. You are my August uh, <laughs> daughter. But you, Demola, I hope you know that this has implications. <laughs> Bullet gang implications, <laughs> and that uh, you can't just go and win an award and get away with it. So you, uh, if you don't know what the implications may, I know you know, but you can consult uh, Rufai Hussaini. Uh, so when you are ready, please let the elders know, oh, and we will celebrate. Well, thank you very much, Congratulations. you both. Congratulations, and bring us more awards. All right, then. We'll begin what's trending in Nigeria. The Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami, has described Kelechi Madu, the Minister of Justice and Solicitor General of Alberta in Canada, as an empty vessel for criticizing the repatriation of Namdi Kanu, leader of the indigenous people of Biafra. This was in response to Kelechi Madu's LinkedIn post, where he had described the AGF as a disgrace to the rule of law and not worthy to be an officer of the court if the reports that Namdi Kanu was adopted were true. The AGF, through his spokesperson, Umar Gwandu, went further to describe the ideas attributed to Madu as outrageously ignoramus opinions that are eccentric and weird to the legal profession, adding that it was unfortunate for someone who claims to be a lawyer to fault the internationally recognized manner through which Namdi Kanu, who jumped bail, was rearrested and brought back to face trial. Tundu <laughs> appears to be the war of the attorney generals at this point. <laughs> yes, it does. That was quite yeah. a vicious yes. clapback from Attorney General Malami. But to be honest with you, I was expecting it. Yeah. Because uh, Mr. Madu's post on LinkedIn was most provocative, or would be if you were, you know, Malami, you would have to respond to that. And I just feel that. The points made by the Attorney General about the internationally recognized process cannot be assumed. They must be proved because there's still a lot of questions around exactly how Namdi Kanu was brought to Nigeria. We all know the, um, the government went to court, took him to court. A bench warrant was issued when he did not show up for his trial. But there are rules and processes. There are laws. And we must obey the rule of law. As for Mr. Madhu Zero outburst on LinkedIn, he was talking about how, sort of showing a lot of sympathy towards Namdi Kanu, forgetting the fact that Namdi Kanu is leading an organization that the Nigerian government has proscribed, right or wrong. That is just a fact of the matter. Whatever your opinion may be, you know, opinions differ from fact. So the Nigerian government has proscribed this organization, same as the Canadian government, where he lives, once proscribed the Liberation Front for Quebec and accused them of terrorist activity. So he should be aware that every country will do it what it can to protect its unity. That's just the fact of the matter. But I do have to say that I have some sympathy to those who are calling for secession. While I don't agree at all on any level with that idea, the fact of the matter is that we cannot continue like this. Recently, in the last like two, three weeks, Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister of England, called on um, Boris Johnson not to assume that the Union of England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland will just stay together. He said that um, Boris Johnson should sit down with these different factions and listen to each person's sensitivities, their hopes, their aspirations. And this is a union that has been in existence since 1801, much less Nigeria, where, where a lot newer, a lot more fragile. So assumptions cannot be made. It cannot be by coercion. It must be by respect. And it must be by equity, quite frankly. No, said Tundu. Dr. Patti, your analysis. Well, yesterday I made the point when you brought the same subject that uh, Kelechi Madu, Attorney General and Solicitor General of uh, Alberta in Canada, was short on points of law, although he made a tangential uh, reference to international law and how, in his consideration, the Attorney General of Nigeria uh, did not follow the rule of law. And I said it was very long on uh, the politics of the matter. And I made the point that that is perhaps understandable. Like Inam de Kanu, he has uh, a dual nationality. Like Inam de uh, Kanu, he's also Igbo. 
and that his uh, submission was more emotional rather than legalistic. Now, he got his own uh, comments with a response from uh, uh, the Attorney General of the Federation of Nigeria. And reading the response uh, by the Attorney General of Nigeria, I had uh, great fun reading through the statement because it was a tit for tat. It was a case of two fighting. And whoever drafted that response for Abuba Kamalami uh, did a very good job. Abuba Kamalami should buy him a bottle of champagne because he did everything possible in that response to discredit and ridicule Kelechi Amado, including referring to him as arrogant and as the attorney general of a provincial place called Abeta in Canada, you know, trying to put down uh, the attorney general of a whole country. I thought that was a very clever uh, repost. Uh, he also accused him of all kinds of things, so-called lawyer and all of that, questioning the credibility and even the knowledge of uh, Kelechi Madu. In fact, Kelechi Madu was accused of uh, going to uh, uh, Canada because he could not make it in Nigeria as a lawyer. So it was very entertaining. Uh, but I think that, okay, this comes with the territory. Yeah. But the more serious point made by the Attorney General of the Federation of Nigeria is that one, due process was followed, and he also uh, went ahead in that statement to provide provisions in Canadian law that shows that when a person uh, is a fugitive from the law, even Canada, France, are that, you know, uh, or if a, a, a bench warrant has been issued, uh, how even in Canada, uh, Canada uh, will not uh, respect that. I think yesterday, Tundu referred to uh, the present prime minister's father and how he handled a similar situation. I don't know whether the office of the Attorney General of Nigeria uh, listened to Tundu yesterday, but they took it from there and provided concrete, uh, you know, legal evidence from Canada to show that uh, Kelechi Mato uh, was perhaps talking emotionally, uh, not as a lawyer. But all the uh, innuendos and the, uh, you know, uh, personal attacks, the argumentum ad hominem, I think was balanced on both sides. But I would advise uh, Kelechi Madu uh, not to uh, get involved in any altercation. He has made his point. Uh, Abubakar Malami has made his point. But what is important is, uh, you know, uh, ensuring uh, that uh, Namde Kanu has his day in court and that it goes through due process and that that due process is fair within the uh, province, the ambit of the rule of law and that justice will be done and it will not only be seen to be done, it will be seen to have been done. Nice. I think that that is where all of us should stay uh, within the ambit of the law. Lawyers, of course, we always fight. If you put three lawyers in a room, you will have five opinions. <laughs> That's where we right. are. Right. Rufai, what do you make of this two fighting as Dr. Abati has described it? When I saw the message, I was appalled by the Attorney General. This is the same man that the Nigerian presidency wrote a letter to congratulate on the 27th of August when he was made the Minister of the Province, Minister of Justice of the Province of Alberta. The Attorney General went further to say a provincial minister. For the record, Alberta is 680,000 square kilometers of land and it has $387 billion in Canadian GDP. That's the GDP of Alberta. So it's not just a pushover. And for the fact that a Nigerian is there, is doing well, is challenging things that are back in the country, limited to law. And I heard he went further to say that it was because he couldn't make it in Nigeria, that's why I went to Canada. Wow. So we're establishing the fact that people can't make it in Nigeria. So is this something we should be proud about, that people can't make it in the country of their birth and they go to Canada and they blow some? That Canada is giving people better opportunities to be able to make it? You see, in making this country work, let's not inflame tensions. Let us all be statesmen. It was still in the same country that the Code of Conduct Bureau chief called a security man Biafran Boyce in the spirit of fighting, too, too fighting and nothing has been done. We all want peace in Nigeria. Nobody wants this country to break apart. I feel we can salvage this country, but when we talk, let us talk to ourselves with a lot of love and respect. This same man you've abused from the diaspora community, diaspora community are bringing 20 billion into this country, but yet you can't give them right to vote. Then you say it's just a common provincial person, but we are so quick to celebrate him. The presidency wrote a letter to celebrate him on the 27th of August. When he emerged, I mean, how many black people are provincial heads in Alberta? Let's be realistic with ourselves. 
All right? I'm not saying justice and rule of law shouldn't take its course. But in all of this conversation, too, there's also something called the sentiment of nation building, the romance of nation building. That's why Mario Cuomo was the one that says, you know, we, 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 we campaign in poetry, but we govern in prose. And this prose of governance has to be told in the, in, in, in the deep stick of unity. We need to always call for unity. We need to always, at every point in time, make ourselves feel that we're part of this union. And if somebody has a disagreement with us or discordant tunes, you can say, okay, this is this about it, but I can explain it to you this way. Not going all personal. I was disappointed that an attorney general, still the same attorney general, that compared, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, nomadic farmers to, 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 to spare part dealers. No, Rufai. You know, Rufai. that compared nomadic farmers to spare part dealers in this country can say such a thing. Rufai. Please, Rufai. let's all douse this tension down. No, Rufai, with due respect. Uh, Kelechi Madu referred to Abubakar Salami as a disgrace to the rule of law. Yes. Abubakar Salami has the right to defend his reputation and he fought back. And that was why I said this is a case of two fighting, a case of teeth for tart. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, Kelechi Madu is uh, Attorney General in uh, Alberta, Canada, does not give him the right to impugn the integrity of another person. If my integrity is impugned and I feel like responding, I think it, I'm perfectly under the uh, ambit of the law uh, to fight back. All and right. that's why I described it as two fighting. The fact that somebody is in Canada or whatever does not give that person the right to put down either his own country or persons in that country. We do respect. Kelechi right. Madu has overstepped his own bounds. We'll take another story. Reactions are trailing former finance minister Kemi Adeoshun after a federal high court in Abuja cleared the controversy surrounding her participation in the National Youth Service Corps scheme. On Wednesday, Justice Taiwo Taiwo ruled that Adeoshun was not qualified to participate in the NYSC scheme when she graduated because she was then a British citizen and was also above the age of participation at 36 when she returned to Nigeria. Adir Shun had tendered her resignation in 2018 following allegations that she tendered a forged NYSC certificate as part of her credentials. Well, in a statement on Wednesday, the ex-minister said the ruling is a victory for Nigerians in the diaspora under similar conditions who desire to serve the nation. Well, the reactions that are trailing this um, case is that the court was silenced on the forged certificate. And that's what a lot of people are talking about. It's not the fact that she, you know, was not uh, qualified to participate at the time. It's the fact that, you know, they had, they had accused her of tendering a forged certificate. But I believe that you guys spoke with uh, her brother, correct? Yes. And the attorney who said that uh, Kemi did not forge any certificate. Yeah, we had a really... Um engaging, I felt, <laughs> discourse with Mr. Zdele Ogun, um, Kemi Adioshan's brother, and Inebehe F. Young on these issues. But generally, a court is not going to rule on an issue that was not pleaded. Yeah, exactly. If that was not what was the issue before the court, they're going to be silent on that. So it's not some kind of omission or anything sinister, like a lot of people seem to be yeah, assuming. That's, that's, that's not the assuming. case at all. All right, yes. Dr. Abati. Okay, the case, the citation is uh, for, La, for La Kemi Adioshan versus the Attorney General of the Federation. And the gravamen of it is that uh, Fola Kemi Adioshan, former Minister of Finance, given the circumstances of her resignation from office in 2018, tried to protect her reputation and went to court to say that the court should provide clarity and interpretation with regard to whether a person who is not a citizen of Nigeria and who may be associated with Nigeria at the time such a person is not a citizen of Nigeria, is required to serve, uh, to observe the mandatory National Youth Service Corps to participate in it. And our point is that yes, she graduated at the age of 22 in 1989, but at that time, she was not a Nigerian citizen. Within the purview of section 26 of the uh, 1979 uh, constitution, at that time, the 1979 constitution was against the idea of dual citizenship. And it says, if you, are, uh, if you have dual citizenship, 
for you to be a citizen of Nigeria, you have to renounce one citizenship to take the other. Now, she returned to Nigeria, I think, at the age of 36. By the age of 36, when she returned, uh, there was already in place the 1999 uh, Constitution. constitution yeah. And the uh, relevant provision in the 1999 Constitution about dual nationality uh, was Section 25 of the uh, 1999 uh, Constitution. So she sought protection under that. And also further, under Section 13, Subsection 2 of the uh, NYSE Act, which says if you are not eligible, to participate in the NYSC and you go ahead, then you are liable to one year imprisonment or a fine of uh, 4,000 naira or both. So the learned uh, justice, uh, Taiwo Taiwo, in a court, at uh, the uh, Federal High Court in Abuja, then ruled that by the provisions of the law, uh, she's not, she was not required either to serve uh, or to, uh, to provide NYSC certificate to be a minister of the Federation. You may say it was a technical point, but basically what she has done is one, to defend her reputation, and in her response she has said she will take more steps to further defend her reputation, that she has not committed any crime, right. and that has been affirmed by the law, and then, uh, by the court, and then she's also saying that this is victory for persons in the diaspora mm -hmm. who may not fall, who may fall within our category. But now that we have the uh, 1999 operative constitution, maybe the extent to which other persons from diaspora may benefit from this precedent uh, that has been established, you know, will be limited. The uh, other point to note is, okay, would the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation appeal this particular case so that we can see it to its logical conclusion? Correct. Maybe yes, maybe not. Now, at the time she left office, we were told that there was an investigation with regard to um, you know, our qualification and all of that. Okay, what is the outcome of that investigation? As she herself tried to make any attempt to find out what the outcome of that investigation is. About the forgery case, that matter was not before the court. A court of law is not a father Christmas. What you don't bring before it, it may not necessarily go on a voyage of discovery. Even if there's something, uh, we talk about judicial activism. Right. And we have had that in political cases where the court will say, oh, it's an, act, it's, it's an activist court and go on. But here, we have not had a case of judicial activism. We have had a technical consideration of the case within uh, the province of the ambit of the interpretation of the uh, Constitution. But I have no doubt that it's uh, understandable that this is a matter of interest uh, to uh, every oh, Nigerian. Nigerian. Absolutely. Rufai, I'll take our final story so you can comment on that. In South Africa, former President Jacob Zuma turned himself in on Wednesday to begin his 15-month jail sentence for contempt of court. The police had been instructed to arrest the former leader by the end of Wednesday if he failed to appear at a police station. While well, hundreds of his supporters, some of them armed with guns and shields, had gathered at his rural homestead in Nkanda to try to prevent his arrest. Rufai, your analysis on this long drawn case. I mean, this is another, in, this is another indication that power is transient and nobody lives forever in power, and we should all be careful. Who would have thought Jacob Zuma, you know, will go through this? He tried everything possible. After the case with the Guptas came out, tried everything possible, evade court, show the former president. When the content of court was charged, when he was charged for that and he was told to report in, in the penitentiary, he called his supporters and he brought about a populist agenda, not just to be able to go to uh, prison. In fact, he finally went to the court to file another paper all in the name of not going to the prison, but it shows you that the law is stronger than the man or anybody that thinks is very powerful. So this should be a lesson to all of us. Jacob Zuma will go to jail, and he has gone to jail. It's not the first time, he has gone before, and he's going to go again. Well, he's there. And that's an indication that things need to be done properly. Right. And that's what South Africa is doing. They are setting the way for all of us to do things. Let's follow the laws of the land. Eh? Because you're a president doesn't mean you're you are bigger than anybody when now. Well, Very well said. Uh, we're set clicking. up this inquiry. Yes. So it's ironic that this has happened to him with the inquiry that he set up. I think at that time he was trying to just placate the people criticizing him for corruption. It didn't work. He was still ousted. So he's going to jail now for 15 months for contempt of court for failing to show up. 
that was a huge mistake. You must show up and defend your case. No, but true. where are the Guptas? Interpol <laughs> has issued a warrant out for the Guptas. I mean, they need to be. Well, so they need to face justice too. If well, so thank you, facing it. Very well said. Thank you That's very much, I, I, I think the thing to today. say is that nobody is above the law. Yes. Anywhere, even a former president, and it's a landmark moment for South African Absolutely. democracy. And the judges have proven that they are truly guardians of democracy.